church this weekend. This was d -Now weekend. We got some of our students here. They had an incredible weekend, encountered Jesus. You know, you might be here, maybe you're a parent of one of these students, maybe you're a first-time guest. We just want to take a second and welcome you to Milestone this morning. We're so glad you're here at church. And here's the thing, we're all in here from different backgrounds and from different walks of life, but there's one thing that's true. We all need a Savior. We all need Jesus, and He's here this morning, and He wants to make a deposit in your life. We believe that with all of our hearts. So as we sing these songs, we hope that you don't see us up on this platform, but that you encounter a living God who's for you, who's a good Father, who has your best interests in mind. And so if you came in here and you have questions, God has answers. If you have a heaviness, God wants to release that. So I just want to encourage you, let's just press in to Jesus. Just open up your heart a little bit. God will meet you there. As you step out in faith, he'll meet you. He's faithful.
he's good. Let's sing this out. Oh, I've heard a thousand stories of what they think you're like, but I've heard the tender whisper of love in the dead of night, and you tell. You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. And I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am.
It's who I am. It's who I am.
thank you for who you are in this place today. God, we thank you for who you are in our lives, God. God, you are our hope. You're the one that we can put our trust in, God. God, we lean into who you are today, Lord. God, we thank you for this weekend. God, we thank you for what you've done in the lives and the hearts of our students and leaders. And God, I believe that today, God, you have something fresh and new for us and that you're gonna do a new thing today. God, we just position ourselves to receive from your word. God, we thank you, Holy Spirit, that you're with us. God, would you move in our lives, in our homes, in our families, Lord? Would you change us from the inside out? God, we thank you for who you are, and we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's give the Lord a hand this morning. Hey everybody, I'm Andrea, and I just wanna take a second to let you know about some things coming up for you and your family around here. Now, maybe you've recently joined our church family and you're ready to start serving on the Dream Team to make a difference here at Milestone. We'd love to help you discover some of your unique gifts and help you find a place to serve. Join us for Dream Team 201 this Sunday, November 15th during the 12.30 p.m. service. It only takes about an hour and you can register online. Throughout the month of November, Milestone Missions is collecting new unwrapped toys and gently used coats to benefit our families in need in our community. You can drop off your donation at the missions table in the atrium. As we enter the Christmas season, there are plenty of other ways to get involved with Milestone Missions, like adopting a family or serving at our Christmas Compassion Outreach on December 15th. For more details on how you can get involved, visit milestonechurch.com slash local missions. One of our favorite things is to see people follow the Lord in water baptism. Now, maybe you're new to a relationship with God, or maybe you've had one for a while now, but you've never been water baptized. December 5th and 6th is your weekend, and there is no better place to experience a moment like this than with your church family. Now, if you've got some questions and you wanna learn a little bit more about this next step, we're having a water baptism class in just a couple of weeks on Saturday, November the 28th, after the 6 p.m. service. Our children's class will be held in the factory and our adult class will be held in the video cafe. It's simple and easy to register online at milestonechurch.com slash baptism. Ladies, believe it or not, Christmas is almost here and you're invited to join Milestone Women and Elevate Girls in celebrating the joy of Christmas. This one night event is a perfect time to celebrate the joy of the season with all of your girlfriends. Our night includes a main program, an encouraging message from Brandy Little, and dessert and photo ops afterwards. So mark your calendars for Tuesday evening, December the 8th at 7 p.m. The cost is only $10 and you can register online or in the atrium today. For more information about anything you've heard today, connect with us online for quick updates on what's going on around here. And thanks again for being with us this weekend. Well, we are excited that you've chosen to join and worship us with our 930 service. What an exciting service. If you are a first time guest with us, or perhaps you're a parent of one of our students, we're especially glad that you're here. So we wanna point out just a simple tool that we use in order to better serve you, and that's our communication card. It's located in the seat back in front of you. And just during the service, if you'll just take a moment and fill out your name, your address, your email, we wanna send you more information about Milestone Church. And just to say thank you for filling out the card, we're gonna send you a gift as well. You'll have plenty of time later on in service. You'll be able to drop that communication card in our giving containers. Or if you miss those, you can always hit our giving boxes when you exit out the auditorium. Well, we got a great service. We got Pastor Jeff here wrapping up our two-week series, Don't Quit. It's a great message. If you would, stand up, greet those closest to you, and tell them it's good to see you at Milestone Church.
Well, I want to welcome you back to our series entitled Don't Quit. I don't know if you felt like quitting at some point recently, but it is a feeling that all of us have as we make this journey through life. We feel like there is something that we're called to, there's something that we're passionate about, there's something that we have great vision for, but when we get out into it, we begin to feel like quitting when things don't exactly line up according to our expectations. Uh, you may have some type of dream for your life. You may have started a new business. You may have a vision for your marriage. You may have started a devotional time, and you decide, I'm going to spend time with God. I'm going to really connect with God, and you get all the materials, or you get a journal, or you get a book, and then you get out into it, and the busyness of life begins to trap you and pull you away from what you set out with a vision for. Or you may have some type of relationship, a, a marriage relationship. I really want to build my marriage. I want to pour into and invest in my children. And then you begin the process and things begin to be challenging and you, and you feel like quitting. There's so many things in our lives that make us want to quit. Uh, you may start a health initiative. We, we might want to start that. The turkey and dressing is coming. Come on, everybody. We don't eat stovetop at the little household. We eat that good southern dressing with the giblet gravy. I feel the Lord. Come on. <laughs> right now would be a good time to start a health initiative. But you get out there and, you know, just, you just quit on the gym. You quit on that. Maybe, maybe you're someone who's been hurt by church, you know that church is a place, it's the house of God, it's where people are planted, it's where they flourish, and you've been through a difficult challenge with church and through relationships, and then you just feel like, you know what, I don't know if that works. I know Jesus doesn't have a different plan, but I just don't know if I can continue into it, and so you, you feel like quitting. Maybe you give up on your favorite college football team. God's anointed team. Don't quit. <laughs> if we could have our quarterback back, we might keep going, but anyway. There's all kinds of reasons to quit. Well, I want to share with you some principles of faith. That's what we've been talking about. Principles of faith. Biblical, authentic, real faith that can help you get to all that God has called you to be and what God's called you to do. I'm going to ask you if you have your Bibles to turn with me to Matthew chapter 8, verse 5. I'm so excited to have these students here with us here at Milestone. Man, we're excited. Here at Milestone, we are passionate about the next generation. We don't want to have one exciting moment here for all of us and then we fail to pass the baton to those coming behind us. We don't believe that you have to wait till you're old to do something great for God, you can do something great today. How many of you believe that? And so we're excited about what God's doing in their lives. Um, I began to think about this, this principle of faith. Um, it's something that, again, there were elements of it that I grew up with, but there are some of the principles that I really want to impart to you are some things I found a little later in my journey some of the other aspects and elements of really walking this thing out. And I, I just began to think this week, you know, sometimes there are things that are um, adaptations of other elements, but sometimes you run into something, and that may happen to you in this series. You just run into something and go, now that's just totally other. That's so different. Uh, that's just out there. Kind of like one of these. How many of you remember the first time you saw one of these? A Segway. Not Paul Blart, the mall cop, but uh, the Segway. It's like, now that is totally other. Well, what is that? It's, it's not an adaptation of something. It's just totally other. What is that? Um, I was out on our property this week, by the way. We've got a road from the south going in. Come on now. And uh, they're clearing the pad site. And so 14 to 16 months, hopefully, uh, we're going to be moving into our new place. And uh, until then, uh, we're going to ask you guys to get one of these and drive it to church. <laughs> It'd be easier to park, all of you, with one of them. We're going to line them up out in the parking lot. <laughs> Something totally other. You know, this idea of faith, when you really get it, it's like, man, this is unique. This is something that I can really apply to my life that I did not have. 
I did not really experience, and I believe that's going to happen for some of you as we walk through it. Last week, I gave you a slide. Let's talk about it this way. I, I wanted you to be able to really grasp it, so I wanted one picture for you, and I'd like us to review that a little bit. We went to this great anchor passage of faith, Hebrews 11, where it says to us that we can have assurance and conviction. Look at the passage with me. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for. I appreciate hope-filled environments because hope is the seed of faith. So you come to a service like this, and you're like, man, the worship, and God's there, and I heard the... So you start with this process of hope. You watch an inspiring story or a great testimony, and you're like, I feel hopeful about my circumstances, about my finances, about my kids. I feel hopeful, but because many times we haven't been taught about biblical faith, it leaves us a little short because hope is only the seed. Hope is the starting place. We have things we hope for, but we've got to move to the place of the conviction of things that we can't see in the natural. We begin to have conviction. Go back to the slide, and I want us to look at this. We start with this idea of faith. Say, Jeff, you're talking about faith. What is that? Well, number one, they're saving faith. The Bible says we're saved by grace through faith. So it's God's grace that he comes and reveals himself to us, but then we put our trust in Jesus Christ, in what Jesus has already done for us that we could never do for ourselves. The payment he made that we could never pay, and we put our faith and trust in what Jesus has already accomplished. That's called saving faith. There's also, by the way, some of you may not know this, there's a gift of faith. 1 Corinthians tells us that there are these manifestations of the Holy Spirit that can come in particular situations, really for others, where there's this atmosphere created when the Holy Spirit shows up, and there can be a gift of faith. But this, this idea that we're talking about this week, last week we talked about what is faith, this week we're talking about how do you live by faith? How do you really live it out? So you start out with this element of faith, you have it, it's working in you, you have this, this trust, this faith, this conviction, and you start out on a great journey, and you get started, and man, it's exciting when you start, but then you're going to hit some pressure-filled moments. You're going to have some problems, you're going to have some circumstances, you're going to have some situations, you're going to have some things not go your way. So you start out, I'm going to love my wife as Christ loved the church, and then the two of you end up in an argument just a few days after that, and you're trying to work through that. You set out to raise a godly kid, and it's like, I don't see it all happening right now. And so you hit that pressure moment, the pressure, the winds, the waves. And it's at this moment where you have the opportunity, if you don't really understand faith, to turn around and go the wrong direction. You just begin to give up. A lot of people quit. A lot of people stop short of seeing the full dream and purpose realized in their life. Young people, I want to encourage you with this. You've had a powerful weekend. You're like, I'm going to see my school change for Jesus. I'm going to see my relationships change. I'm going to say no to the pressures of my culture. I'm going to say no to those things. I'm going to say no to the things that are happening at parties. I'm going to say no. I have a burden for these young people. They face a world with technology and the temptations that come against them via technology. There are many of you have said, you know what, I'm going to live a holy life. I'm going to live for Jesus. I'm going to marry a godly spouse. I'm going to be a person of integrity. Here's what happens, though. You come into a weekend. You get this momentum, and we can all relate because all of us have the same challenges. And if it were easy, everybody would do it. And then comes the pressure of the enemy. Then comes the wind. Then comes the challenges. And that's why we looked at Romans 4.20 where Abraham is the father of our faith. And he set out to go toward what God had called him, this city that's architect and builder is God. Did not totally understand exactly what it would look like, but he kept taking steps. God told him he'd be the father of many nations. He didn't have a child. He was up in age. His wife had a child. It was just biologically impossible, but here's what this verse, we anchored ourselves to some of the words. He did not waver in unbelief, but he was strengthened in his faith, and he became fully persuaded, 
fully persuaded that God was going to accomplish this. And so when you anchor yourselves to assurance, conviction, strengthen in faith, you're able to press through to the promise that God has for you. But if you're lacking this element of faith, then you're wondering why I don't really have the power to really press through. Okay, So we're going to look at how to live by faith this weekend at Milestone Church. If you have your scriptures there, let's look at another famous faith passage involving Jesus. And we'll see here what he's trying to communicate to us through the life of a centurion. It says Jesus had entered Capernaum. Jesus, you might not know the context, he's just had this Sermon on the Mount moment where he had his famous teaching. He moving to, he's moving toward Capernaum, which is where he would set up his ministry headquarters. This is where he would base out of. And so it says a centurion came to him. You may not know who that is or what that is. That's a man of the Roman army who had this word century 100, not always, but most of the time, at least 100 soldiers underneath him that he was the captain of. He came to him. So this is a man of an important man. He came to him and he was asking for help. He said, Lord, he, re he, he references the authority of Jesus. He said, Lord, he said, and he's also asking for help so he knows the right place to go. He said, my servant lies at home paralyzed, suffering terribly. The Bible's showing a role reversal here. Many times when someone asked for help, it was a family member. Many times that we would think, you know, it's like Jesus would prefer the important person, but right here we see a great heart from this centurion that he cares about his servant. He's caring about him. So he says he's suffering terribly, and Jesus says something to him that what if Jesus said this to you? You're at that obstacle point. You're at that pressure point. Jesus said, shall I come and heal him? Shall I come and heal him? Jesus could have just said, I will come in healing, but sometimes Jesus gives us the opportunity to learn through the process of what he's doing in our lives. Shall I come in healing? The centurion replied something interesting. Lord, I don't deserve to have you come under my roof. He, he had a very relational understanding, this guy, for someone in his type of work. He understood that Jesus was a key Jewish public authority figure, and it would be embarrassing for Jesus to come into his house. It does not meet the protocol, so he's recognizing where Jesus is, has love for his servant, says, you don't need to come under my roof, but look at the revelation he has, but just say the word. If you'll just say the word, and my servant will be healed. And here's where he recognizes the authority of Jesus under God the Father, Jesus coming with all the power of heaven. He says this, for I myself am a man under authority. You don't receive from the authority that you're hanging around. You receive from the authority that you're under. That you're under. He's under the authority of Jesus here. He says, I'm putting myself under your authority. He says, I'm a man under authority. So he's relating that. He says, with soldiers under me, I tell this one go, and he goes, and that one come, and he comes. And I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed. You may underline that in your Bible. Jesus was amazed. Jesus gives him a good amen. There's only one other place, Mark 6.6, 6, where this word is used. This, this exact word, Jesus was amazed, not in the good sense. He was amazed at their level of unbelief. He could not do anything because of their unbelief. Here he's amazed at this guy's faith. I, had, I was preaching in another place uh, a few months ago, and uh, I, I had uh, a really good amen. You love, it, this place was interesting. It was dynamic. The people were responding. It was their culture. And and, uh, you know, as a pastor, you always love to preach to people that are into what you're saying. These people were really into it, and I almost, like, spontaneously combusted and went running around the room. <laughs> but I have never had an amen like this. I was preaching. It was an okay point. I think it was okay. It was decent, you know, and I make this point. There's a guy sitting right over in this, over, this area over here. This really happened. He's sitting right over here. There's about 3,000 people there. I'm preaching, you know, and just kind of trying to keep my head together, and everybody's kind of responding, and this one guy over there goes, that's amazing. That's, am that's amazing. If y'all ever want to do that, it'd be real encouraging <laughs> to me. 
I mean, I, I thought, I don't know if it's that good, but man, I feel powerful right now. You know? like, I've never had an amen like that. Jesus gave this guy, that's amazing. He said to those following him, truly, I tell you, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. You know, God is sovereign, but one thing we have to recognize about Jesus, he was always looking at the faith level of the people around him. He was constantly saying, you know what, you'll be healed because of your faith. He was watching the atmosphere of cities, people, individuals. He said, I haven't found such great faith. Then he goes into an interesting discourse, and he says, I say to you that many will come from the east and the west. They'll take their places at the feast with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the subjects of the kingdom will be thrown outside into the darkness where there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. You see, what does that mean? What Jesus is talking about, again, he's showing how Sometimes it's the least likely. Sometimes it's those on the outside. The centurion is a Gentile. He's someone outside of the knowledge, outside of the heritage, outside of the position. And that's many times what the Bible communicates to us. Sometimes those who have the most access to live great faith are sometimes the least likely to do it. Why is that? Why is that with people with so much at their disposal, so much opportunity? They're sometimes the one who receive the least. We're about to have Thanksgiving. There's going to be the big people table and the little people table. Everybody at the little people table wants to get to the big people table. Here's what he's saying. There's some people sitting at the big people table who don't get it. They don't get it. They have head knowledge. They have intellectual knowledge. They have position. They have every opportunity but there's going to be some people sitting at the little table who move to the big table because they have faith and trust in me. That's what he's saying. Verse 13. That's amazing. <laughs> then Jesus said to the centurion, go, let it be done. And here's what he's, he's, recommend, he's, he's commending. Go, let it be done just as you believed it would. So Jesus is commending and recognizing this man's faith and his belief and trust fully in his authority and what he says. So let's apply that to our lives today. You say, Jeff, that's a great story. Now, what do I do with what? You, what are you trying to tell me? How am I going to be prepared for my challenging moment? How am I going to make it across when all the pressure comes and the wind comes? How am I going to do that? Well, I'm going to give you a few ways. How do you live by faith? Not just receive Jesus, but now how do you live by faith? Number one, faith comes from the word. Faith comes. You're like, Jeff, is this a personality thing? Is this like a particular persuasion of Christianity thing? Is this just a certain type of stylistic thing? I mean, do I have to go get this? Do I have to grab this? Do I have to make this happen? You need to understand this verse right here. If you're wondering where do you get faith, I told you last week, I'm a quitter by nature. You're looking at me going, whoa, Pastor Jeff, you know, you're a preacher, you're, you're moving forward. I am a quitter by nature. I have a creative, relational, sensitive side. I mean, I get afraid of stuff, I'm intuitive, and so I pick up on a lot of the challenges. By nature, I would stop. But early on in my journey, I began to get anchored to. In fact, I remember a particular moment in my early 20s where the principles I'm teaching to you, I saturated myself in these principles and in these truths to prepare myself. How do you get it? It's not for special people. It's not just for preachers. It's not just for pastors. Here's where it comes from. Faith comes. Everybody say, faith comes. Faith comes, faith comes to you. It comes to you. Look where it says, from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. It comes to you by the word. It comes to you as you begin to engage with the word. You might need to start out with just a couple of scriptures. You need to find yourself being anchored to the promises of God beyond your circumstances. With so much to analyze, with so much to look at in our world today, there's so much to absorb yourself with. If you're going to have faith, then you're going to have to anchor yourself to the word of Christ. Not what does someone else say, not what did you inherit from someone else, but what does the word of God say? Every promise is yes and amen. You begin to say, what does this word say? 
And, and so look at another verse here. It says, the word of God is living and active. This is not information alone. Yes, we get information from the Word, but it's not just stories. It's not just information, and it's not just us winning some kind of Bible quiz and knowing a bunch of information. It's living, and it's active. There's an impartation of the Word of God, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, joints and marrow. I love this verse. And it discerns the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. It has the ability to break me out of my fears. It has the ability to break me out of my insecurities because it can go right down to the deepest level. Let me illustrate it to you this way. As I've been burdened about this series, I really have. I've been teaching on this to our staff. I taught it in our, we had a little pastor's gathering. I, I'm teaching on this because I'm finding today with the proliferation of writing and information on the fact that God's in charge, God's in control. Thank you that we can anchor ourselves. I am so thankful we anchor ourselves to a sovereign God who is in control. I'm thankful that we live in a day and age today where we can be transparent about us going through challenges. Faith is not ignoring the challenges. It's not, not being honest about the challenges. But what I'm finding as I mentor and work with some of the young people over here, as I'm a parent, as I work with young leaders, as I work with business leaders, as I'm a pastor around people, here's what I'm finding. In our current generation, the deposit of what I'm preaching has not been transferred, and people are missing a gear. They're missing a gear. There's something. When you hit that pressure moment, you got to have a gear to move you forward. My daughter is about to start driver's ed. She's really into it. I'm not so much. But she's getting, I may or may not have let her drive a few times before she has her permit, certain safe places, and, and letting her practice. And I was with her practicing out in the country the other day when we were at my folks' house, and I thought, man, she's got it easy. She has an automatic car to drive. Now, I'm going to show some of your age. You know what I learned on? My dad had a 1970. I'm going to even see if some of y'all even know what this is. 1970 model Ford, lots of metal in it. Cars today have no metal. This thing was a battleship. And it was three on the tree. Come on, somebody. Who knows what three on the tree? Y'all are old. Y'all are old. My dad said, if you're going to learn to drive, boy, you got to learn on a standard. Not five in the floor, three on the tree. And the clutch was burned out. <laughs> we got in that big old battleship, and he said, boy, you need to learn how to drive. And right outside of our driveway in the little neighborhood I grew up in, it was downhill. And it was great when we were downhill. And so we were just moving. I'm pushing the brake. The problem was after the downhill part was an uphill part. How many of you know you need some faith and a gear to get uphill? <laughs> Anybody can go downhill. I get to the uphill part, and I, the clutch is burned out. Y'all know what happened. <laughs> then I push the clutch, which disengaged, and so I get halfway up the hill, start rolling backwards. Don't know how to work the brake. Both feet, you know, three on the tree. This is confusing. We're in the ditch. When you start uphill in life, easy downhill, you better have a gear. You better know how to put it in a gear. Not a gear based on you, but a gear of faith. And I find a lot of people perpetually discouraged, perpetually wanting to quit. Is it okay to have challenging times and get a little discouraged? We all do. But you've got to get strengthened in your faith. You've got to have a gear that says, okay, I'm going up this hill. But it comes from the Word of God. One of the most powerful moments in a follower of Jesus' life is when they no longer just listen to the content from the preacher, but they have their own personal time with Jesus from the Word, where the Word of God gives them the gear. And they can apply it. And it's not just information. Are y'all with me? Look, God is in control. He's in control of my life. He's ordering the steps of the righteous. This is not based on me. But let me tell you, when you're trying to go uphill, God is in control just doesn't cut it. Just doesn't cut it. You have to have a gear of faith that says, yes, God is in control, but he asked me the question, shall I come and heal him? 
Shall I come? It comes from the Word of God. Number two, you say, Jeff, how do you live by faith? Faith develops. It's not theoretical or intellectual. It's living and active. It develops in your life. Romans 1.17 says this, For in the gospel the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last. Just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. Paul's quoting Habakkuk 2, where he talks about the personal nature of faith, in fact. But the righteous shall, what? Live by his faith. Live by his faith. He will begin to live by this faith that's developing on the inside of him. The Bible says we move from faith to faith, glory to glory. You say, Jeff, I don't even know how to get there. I want to quit every time I start uphill or I try to go through the pressure. I, I, I most of the time do quit. I don't feel like I'm there. Well, just start where you are and begin to grow and begin to develop and begin to step out and begin to act on what you already do know. You're not just going to all of a sudden be able to conquer some huge mountain. You have to start by conquering some of the little hills, but it'll grow in you. It's like you don't walk in the gym and just pick up 200 pound dumbbells. You know, I like the little pink ones myself. <laughs> You know, the ones that you jog with or do aerobics. You know, you, you start and what happens, but you can't stay on the pink ones. You, you, you pick up the pink ones and then you pick up the fives and then you pick up the tens. And did you know one thing I learned when my dad went through a sickness? Uh, he had a routine surgery that went bad. He had a colon surgery and they were resuturing his colon and it went bad and, and he ended up in ICU. And I've, I've seen this as I've worked with people and people that end up with illnesses. How fast the body and the muscles atrophy when they're not used. My dad spent a few months in ICU. He had to learn to walk again. He literally had to learn to walk again. Do you know, I watch a lot of people because they haven't been taught these principles. I'm not talking about going to heaven. But I'm talking about not having a lot of strength because they're not developing the spiritual muscles of faith along the way. You can atrophy real quick when you just start going backwards. I want to encourage you with this. No matter where you are today, your faith can develop if you'll get active in the process. It'll develop. It'll grow. It'll build. Here's number three. Number three, faith overcomes. Faith overcomes. Look at this verse right here. I love it. This is the victory. We used to use that word a lot in church in the 80s and 90s. So we named churches victory. You know, it's not so cool now. It's not so cool. It's more the God's in charge church. You know, God's okay with whatever we're doing church. It's not, we don't talk about that a whole lot anymore. This is the victory. This means winning. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. I want to encourage you with that. Again, Jeff, are you saying that, you know, we, we can't have any problems and we don't have troubles or challenges and, like, God's not aware of that and he can't help us in that? No, no, I, I am acutely aware of the challenges you live. Remember, I'm a pastor. I've lived with people. I'm, I'm amazed at some of the things people walk through and challenges. I'm not saying that. And, and, and we're not necessarily always looking at the exact outcome and saying, you know, you did something wrong if this outcome didn't happen. That's an imbalance about faith. That's not what I'm saying. But what I am saying is we cannot regress into a, a, a belief about the Bible that says you can't have a godly marriage. You can't win over sin. You can't overcome. Greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. And I want to tell you something, parents, by the way, too. Again, I appreciate that, you know, God's in charge and gets whatever's God's will. If it be thy will, we know God's will. We have the word. But I want to tell you something, parents, too. These young people, they want to be in an environment that is encouraging them that you can overcome things in this world. Some people say, well, we just can't, you know, we just can't, you know. No, no, we can, we can have victory over the world if we will continue to develop and continue to grow in our faith. I was talking to a person just last week, had heard the message that I preached last week, and uh, she said, you know, I, I was never taught this. We, I, I didn't know you could win. We just sort of came to church and, 
you know, you try to act right and you listen to a few theological concepts and, you know, Jesus died for us and no one ever told me, like, like we can win in this. We can actually overcome the world. She was just like, I, I want to hear more of this. I want to know more about this. And, and I thought I had this initial impression. It's kind of like what we do with young people in education today sometimes. We just say, look, just, just, just learn the test. Just learn the test, and if you can regurgitate the right answers in the test, then now you are equipped for the future. How many of y'all been living long enough to know that's not going to get it done? you got to know how to think. You've got to know how to think. You've got to know how to apply. You can't just regurgitate a few answers on the test and feel like you're going to be successful in life no more than you can have a walk with Jesus that's just regurgitating a few Sunday school answers and you're going to be able to overcome the pressure. You can't. You have to have the ability to walk by faith. You have to have the ability to actually apply the promises of God to the pressure situations of your life. This lady, it's amazing what God's, hap what God's doing. Our whole family's being revolutionized. Sisters have come to Christ praying for one of her sister's marriage to be restored and reconciled. I mean, it's like God is moving all around her world when she finally realized we can overcome some things. How many of y'all like to win? I want you to win. I want you to win. Does that not mean we never have setbacks? We do. We don't believe that in this church, that you don't have setbacks, you don't have problems, you don't have pressures. But we're moving from faith to faith, glory to glory. We can overcome some things. Here's number four. Number four, faith rests. I don't want anyone to listen to this series and say, well, Jeff is basically saying this is all about us alone, that we now need to get in the flesh, be driven by our flesh, and it's all about us. No, actually, the truth is, faith is resting in the victory that Jesus has already purchased for us. The truth is, we're tying into one who's already won the battle for us, because faith Rest. I love this passage of Scripture. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus. Jesus is who we're looking unto, not our circumstances, not the winds and the waves, not the pressures. We're looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Faith rests. It doesn't have to strive. It doesn't have. There's a confidence that begins to come out of your life when you rest in what Jesus has already accomplished. When you understand, it's like in a courtroom, right? You have the defense, you have the prosecution. The judge looks at the defense. Once they're done making their case, the defense rests. The prosecution rests. Once all of it's been done, it's, it rests. Once Jesus Christ died on the cross, rose from the dead, now is our great advocate lawyer making intercession for us before the throne room of heaven, before God, Jesus, who's already accomplished it, once he sat down and he rests in everything he's done and said, I've done everything for you. You have everything that pertains to life and godliness. I died for you. I rose for you. I poured out my spirit for you. You have everything you need. He says, look, now you can rest in that finished work. Rest does not mean inactivity because faith without works is not faith at all. It's dead. But it is as I move forward, I'm not moving in my own strength and my own ability. I'm resting in what he's already accomplished. And so I'm resting. Here, let me apply it for you this way. And then, I, then I'm going to tell you a story and pray for you. When you have, the, we talked last week about a passage, a spirit of faith on your life. Meaning, I know what Jesus has done. He's my good advocate. The Heavenly Father is a good Father. He knows what I need before I ask. When you have that confidence and trust in Jesus, not you, it creates a different atmosphere around your life. It just does. You, you don't have to be insecure about your future. You don't have to strive. You don't have to live insecure. Why? Because it's not based on you anyway. It's based on Jesus. You, you, don't, you don't have to, in the marketplace, you don't have to worry about title, position, uh, you don't worry about that because you know what? I'm going to continue to grow. I'm going to continue to steward. And the Bible tells me that promotion doesn't come from the east or the west anyway. It comes from God. So I know God is the one that's making a way. So if I'm frustrated with what's going on at my job right now, if I'll begin to do what I need to do, 
And that start lifting some weights and growing in my faith and create a contagious atmosphere of faith even around my life. God's the one who removes those barriers. I'm going to be responsible for what I'm responsible for, but I'm going to rest in what he's already done. You know what else you can do? You can be a good friend and celebrate others when you have faith in your life. You know why? Them getting something in their life. That's the, Today, with all of the voices and now media's created voices for people, there's so much criticism. And you just pay attention to the people that are critical. You know what their problem is? They don't have faith and trust in God that he has actually something for them. So I've got to tear down everybody else so that I feel better about myself. When you have faith, you can celebrate other people's victories. You know why? Because their victory doesn't have anything to do with the victory that he's already purchased for me. He's already purchased something for me. So I'm confident today, and I'm going to celebrate you and and I'm going to keep moving toward what God has for me along the way. Quick story. There was a, a Kenyan young boy named Douglas Wacklahurry. Really interesting name. There was a British school teacher in the 1970s that adopted this young man and began to send him money. And after a while of sending him money, they began to exchange letters and Douglas wrote in the letter to her, didn't have a lot of authority figures around his life to encourage him, and he wrote to her one day in the letter and said, I'm ugly. She quickly wrote back to him and said, you're not ugly, you're created in the image of God, just began to encourage him, began to build him. He then later wrote back and said, I'm not smart, and she wrote back to him and encouraged him in that area as well. Just kept that dialogue going over and over. He eventually wrote to her and said, I recognize that I'm fast. I'm faster than a lot of my friends. And she encouraged him. Well, the, the long story of it, the short story of it is, is that uh, he began to win races. He began to win marathons, long distance running, began to do amazing things. 1988, he won the silver medal at the Olympics. He had a layover coming back from the Olympic ceremony. He had a layover in London and he went and found this lady, now a lot, not a lot older and in a wheelchair. And he took that silver medal and he put it around her neck and said, you're the real one who's won this silver medal. She said, oh, no, no, you did this. And he said, the fact of the matter is, if you hadn't continued to speak those words, what we're talking about today, those words of faith, if you hadn't had that perspective, this medal never would have happened. Here, here's what I want to encourage you. you. Just take that story and think about the impact that all of us have. You getting this principle has a huge impact on you getting through the barriers, but it also has a massive impact on those around you. It has an impact on your life as you go forward, and, and you just don't need to underestimate the, the beyond comprehension impact that grabbing a hold of these principles can produce in your life. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads with me. Bow your heads with me, and you say... If you're here today and you say, Jeff, I don't have that starting place of faith. I'm really not right with Jesus. I don't really know Jesus. I'm not even at that starting place. Then the first step you need to make is you need to make a simple move of surrender, really. It's really a receiving of a gift that's already been bought for you. And that is just to simply say, you say, Jeff, what do I do? I'm tired of losing. I'm tired of wanting to quit. Well, ultimately, the end of the race is, is eternity. That you will spend eternity with Jesus or without Jesus. You'll either be at the big table or you'll be at the little table pushed out to the outer places away from the feast that Jesus has prepared for you. If you say, I want to live this life by faith, but also want to have a faith and trust in Jesus so that eternally I can live with him, you need to simply, right where you are, say, Jesus, come into my life. I give myself to you. I've made mistakes. I've missed the mark. I, I feel guilty about the way I've lived. But I'm thankful that you paid the price for it. I confess you as my Lord and Savior. I believe you died on the cross. I believe you rose from the dead. And I receive you today as my Lord and Savior. Make it personal. Jesus, become my Jesus, my Lord, my Savior. I want to follow you today. If you prayed that prayer, I'm going to ask you if you would to let us know so that you can start your journey now. You can learn how to live by faith. Give us a communication card. Come to 
one of the Grow Track events. Come forward at the end of the service. Let us know. You got to let somebody know so that you can start your journey. You can be baptized here in a few weeks. What a great first step of faith to actually start to grow in what has happened in your heart and life. But Lord, second of all, I'm praying specifically for some people who have had the overwhelming urge to quit. And I'm asking you, Lord, for an impartation of faith. I'm asking you for something that goes deeper than just words, but will be followed up by action, that they'll begin to take some steps. Lord, I pray for these young people gathered in this service as they go back into the pressures of this world. I pray, Lord, that they would have something so deep in them that they can overcome by faith because you have overcome the world. We thank you, Lord, today for that faith in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to ask our ushers to come forward. We're going to receive our tithes and offerings at this time. This would be the time to give us that communication card if you're a guest. Thank you for being with us today if you're a guest, by the way. We'd love an opportunity to serve you. Thank you for being a generous church. Here a few weeks ago, we celebrated $1.1 million in missions giving. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> Lives, people, children, single moms, widows, people getting cars. That's all because of you and your generosity. I love pastoring a generous church. So Lord, bless your people today as they give. Bless every single person, family. Bless every business. Bless people starting businesses right now. Lord, I pray they would cooperate with you. They would have their, your favor upon their lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Therefore, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he inaugurated for us through the veil, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful.
What does it look like to pray in faith? It's us grabbing a hold of these promises. The fact that God's with us, that he loves us, and he really hears us, and he wants to respond on our behalf. So maybe it's events that happen literally across the world that have broken our heart as we pray for Paris. Maybe it's a burden you carry in your own life, or maybe a friend. These trained leaders are gathered here to show you what does it look like to take steps of faith through prayer. I want to remind you guys, at 6.30 tonight. we got a great time of worship. Our worship night is tonight at 6.30. Pastor Jim will be here. We'll have extended worship, so we want to invite you back tonight at 6.30 for that. And if not, if we don't see you, then we'll see you back right back here at Milestone next week. Have a great weekend.